The University of Detroit Mercy presents another brand new episode of Ask the Professor, the radio show on which you match wits with the University of Detroit Mercy professors in an unrehearsed session of questions and answers. Today's program was recorded using Zoom video conferencing technology. The University Tower Chimes bring in another session of Ask the Professor, the show on which you match wits with the University of Detroit Mercy professors in an unrehearsed session of questions and answers. I'm your host, Matt Mayo, and let me introduce to you our panel for today. In the upper left, ooh, it looks like he recently got a haircut. It's Professor Dave Chow. I had several cuts, so uh, <laughs> pleasure to be here, as always. Oh, good. That's good. I was, I was getting sick and tired of my Mickey Dolan's look there, that's all, so I had to... Uh, <laughs> Had to cut it back. As one is wont to do. Yes, I need to. So so um, what is going in the fried rice tonight? You said you're cooking. Let's see. I picked up a pound of the barbecued pork, got two heads of kohlrabi out of the garden, uh, stock of Yum. celery, and all kinds of weird, wacky spices. And let's see, a pound and a half of ham, uh, oh, carrots, um, and just... Things. You're making us all hungry. Yeah, sorry. That's well, what you, always happens. Well, you know how this show goes; it always revolves around food. That's, that's true. right. Yeah. But I make I'm making like twelve servings. <laughs> so so leftovers. So I, I I can even feed the Mayo yes. household and still have some <laughs> leftover. So. Oh my gosh! Frankly, um, <laughs> my mind is making connections where there it need not because I heard you say I got X pounds of kohlrabi from the garden and my mind was making up oh he got it out of the garbage oh that's nice. yeah <laughs> well it's cheaper that way yes it is, <laughs> that it is. Uh, continuing around the horn uh professor aaron bell is here with us from the center for excellence in teaching and learning Hey everyone. Um, I liked how you brought up or brought the conversation back, Dave, to Mickey Dolan's throwback to a few episodes ago. So that's always nice. Um, hope everyone's doing well. I had a great time at homecoming last week and yeah. great to see so many of you in person. It was kind of like, oh, outside of the box, literally. So that's, that's what right. they look like below the waist. Yes. Really it's... short in person. Don't know if you know. <laughs> <it>. <laughs> so. You know, it. Um, we certainly have recorded in person multiple times since the pandemic started, but I will repeat, we have not been in studio since I believe it was Friday the 29th. Uh, it was Leap Day. That's hard to forget, uh, 2020. So yeah. we are hoping to bring that back relatively soon. As long as the Michigan weather doesn't recover from this high of 51 today, I think we're going to be there relatively soon. So awesome. Fingers crossed. Uh, continuing again around the panel, Professor Jim Tubbs is here. Hello, hello. What's going on, Jim? Well, not a whole lot. Not a whole lot. It's been a it's been a slow day. Yesterday was busier. Okay. But, uh, this has been a good one, and it's uh, it's it's nice, cheerful autumn looking yes, weather. Yes, it is <laughs> cheerful from the perspective of those who like the overcast skies, which I have no problem with. I'm just putting. Well, I meant color. You know, yes. we've got some color finally. Yes, we do. Uh, just a couple of cold snaps, right, Jim? And then we'll be right back in uh, in the mix of so. things. So Canadian was... summer. It's a Canadian summer. <laughs> I had a big argument with someone the other day about when Indian summer is supposed to take place. Jim, what's your answer to that question? Indian summer. I think it's like the first or second week in November, isn't it? Usually? That's right. That's right. I, I, I could have sworn it was in November and someone's like, oh no, it's like mid-October. I'm like, really? It's like, eh, I think it's well, who knows? It may be in Detroit, but yes, yeah, that's it's true. supposed to be in early November. No, that's true. That's true. Uh, continuing to the end of the panel, but not the end of all things, it's Professor Beth Oljar. Uh oh, did we lose her? Oh no. Oh, we, we see her face oh. frozen in this wonderful smile uh, oh. on the screen, but we're going to have to wait till her uh, internet begins behaving again to be able to get back into that. She'll be back. She'll be back. Uh, folks, this is a program where you can send us questions regarding anything. If you stump the panel, you win a prize. If you don't stump the panel, you win a prize. You can send us the questions in a number of ways. Email us at atp at udmercy.edu. Find us on Facebook or Instagram or listen on your favorite smart speaker by asking it to play Ask the Professor at University of Detroit Mercy. Okay, uh, I think that we've got Beth back here. Let's see what happens if I mention her name. So far, so good. She blinked. <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't know what is up with my internet connection. I keep uh, trying to get 
you know, reconnected and it, it connects and then it does whatever it does again. I am not entirely sure, but no worries. We can hear you loud and clear right so now, if, Beth. If I cut out, that's probably why. <laughs> okay. Well, just tell Drew to stop putting the catnip on the, on the internet wires. That's all. So. <laughs> All right, folks, we've got an awesome set of questions here that were sent in by uh, Kimberly Richards, long time um, uh, Ask the Professor question sender from Van Nuys, California. And uh, Kimberly just does the most awesome job, um, Aaron, as a newer panelist of giving tons of background on each of the questions. So we could, you could, you know, it's like, uh, I don't know, a meal that makes you feel full for eight hours. It's good stuff here. So it's not Chinese food. That's not Chinese food. Right. No simple sugars here. Um, let's see. What singer has her own line of sweet potato pies? I've read about this before, mm-hmm. and I feel like it's someone who is R&B. Um, Correct. Like a Lizzo or somebody like that? No, no. Uh, Further back, I want to oh, like say a Beyonce or somebody older, no, older, older, oh. older. Good, nice, solid connection to Detroit. That's another clue. Oh, like a Martha Reeves. Reeves? Mm-mm, mm-mm. Oh, oh, a good, solid connection. To Let's see. This singer teamed up with Walmart to make a sweet potato pie, which have consistently flown off the shelves, thanks in part to a YouTube star, uh, James Wright uh, Chanel's Ode to Them. Someone made a special song uh, because he loved the pies. A 2015 video went viral, and as of mid-22, still has more than 6.5 million views. According to Walmart, on average, across all their stores, they were selling a pie per second after the video dropped, and they are um, still available there today. Uh, Let's see. This singer says, sweet potato pie is in my blood. My mother and father, all of my great aunts, my great grandmother, and everybody grew up oh, eating sweet um, potato pie. You know it. I know you um, know it. Anita know Baker? It. No, but you're getting so oh, close. So close. Oh, you're killing me. Who well, else? Okay, female. Detroit, Detroit, right? I mean, uh, there's a Detroit connection. There's a De- I won't say that she lives here or anything. Oops. But, but like a Motown, like a Motown, uh, not Motown, more oh. just like likes hanging out here, has good uh, roots here. Petty uh, Smith, la- last chance, last chance. The oh. initials are P L P L. Patty Labelle. Patty Labelle. Oh, there we go. Patty Labelle. Okay, oh. that's it. Patty Labelle's sweet potato pie, and of course, it's not just about the fun of having a celebrity endorse a product. It's about a viral video that got people buying that product. So I can see it now. My fried rice is going to have to go viral sooner rather than later. That's how how I'm going to fund my retirement, right? Mm -hmm. What bird did Edgar Allan Poe briefly consider having uttered the phrase nevermore in the poem we know as the raven? A vulture? A mockingbird? Uh, Both of those are good guesses. Dave, was it a seagull? I'm just kidding. Um. Uh, mine, mine, who, mine. Who, who else? Yeah, what, what other bird can mock human? A crow? A crow is getting, well, I well, can't say it's getting closer. I think you might be ignoring the most logical um, response. Yeah, it was a parrot is what he was oh. considering. Yes, just... because, you know, I mean, in the poem, it doesn't make that much sense to have the bird only say one thing and repeat it a lot of times, but I mean, it's a poem. It's not reality. So uh, yeah, but the the raven just seems so much darker and so much more appropriate. You know, I mean, yeah, it's it's playing with him. Yeah, yeah. that's right. That's right. Yeah, hey, a parrot sounds like, you know, like you know, Long John Silver or something like that. You know, it just doesn't. Not the same. That's exactly what it says here. The parrot did not perch so well in Poe's <laughs> mind because it didn't fit the mood he was going for. It's like. What mood was Poe going for? Oh, melancholy. Well, yeah, it's sure. kind of like melancholy. Uh, we didn't adopt the turkey as the national bird. Of the United yeah, States. thanks, Ben Franklin. <laughs> yes, exactly, <laughs> exactly. By the way, uh, Poe referred to melancholy as, quote, the most legitimate of all poetical tones, unquote. Oh, well, the original emo. Um. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, exactly. The Baltimore the- goth kid, right? <laughs> For the record, a parody of the Raven titled The Parrot appeared in 1856, about a decade after Poe revealed his original thought process was 
well, what's a bird that can talk? Because that was really his only criteria at that point. Yeah. Okay. In restaurant jargon, see, everything Ooh. comes back to food. We started with patio bell, yep. sweet potato pies. In restaurant jargon, what is an autograt? A U T O G R A T. And we're glad to have you back, Beth. Automatic gratuity. Being yes. There we go. Oh, look at she that. She logs in. She look at that. She right logs in and knocks it right out of the park. Man. That is right. That is right. Automatic gratuity. Got to do that as a former server. Sometimes you get those parties of 15 or 20 people split checks and you leave with like a $2 tip. So auto gratuity oh, all the way. Yes. That's, that's when somebody you know, like loses a tire, right? Oh, did I say that? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> by the way, among some diners, it is commonly referred to by a derogatory term. Can you think what that term might be? My mom used to call it communism. <laughs> Some people call it a mandatory tip. A mandatory oh, okay. tip. Yeah. So yeah. love it. Love it. Oh, it's Beth like the term communism. communism. <laughs> well, I mean, no, no, seriously. That's what she called it. I mean, because <laughs> they, they tried it for a month where she worked and they just didn't, you know, it's like they just didn't fly. That's all. Um, you're gonna love this next question. This question has a very high probability of going into ask the professor lore forever. Uh -oh. Wait Ooh. a minute. Is, is this like is this like a Diane Manica, Johnny Mathis, Johnny Mattress kind of lore? I, I hope that I didn't just jinx it by saying that out loud. But how did the device, the container, let's say, the dumpster, get its name? Oh my god! This <laughs> is named after like great Enrico Dump or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I laugh out loud, but. That is a reasonable guess is all I'm going to well, say. It used to be carried on the back of a dump truck. I mean, that, that's the most logical way to approach this, okay? It's like Dan Maggio. Let's approach this mathematically, right? <laughs> but it, that is not it. That is not it. I mean, it could have been called a prasad. I mean, you know. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Oh, my gosh. For the record, in most large cities pre-1930s, folks had to toss trash by hand and used a bunch of easy to carry buckets or bins to accomplish the task. However, if one had a large amount of waste to go out and very few city services available, largely by the way, horse-drawn wagons, to collect it might take weeks before it reached the capacity to do so. Today's dumpsters range from small driveway size, of course, to some that are bigger than a minivan and sometimes even bigger than that. So how did the dumpster get its name? This is great this is just great all i can tell you for your last clue is that it does have to do with someone's name oh so i wasn't that far off you were not what? you were not it was i believe you said named Enrico dumpster? dump <laughs> i'm sorry beth somebody named dumpster i mean i mean i'm giving it to you that's 99 percent. The, the first dumpster company was founded by george dempster whose oh. name was all over the product. <laughs> yes, it was. Dempster Dumpster. Uh -huh. And that is the way it got okay. its name. That is, I, that's legendary. That's Just cool. Legendary. Well, I don't know. Right about now, it could also be named after the, 45, the 45th president. Too. <laughs> well, he, he's, or, in, he's in competition with Thomas Crapper there. For well, the, and, and, or, or Herschel Walker. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> in 2004, were you paying attention? No. <laughs> Congress designated a national tree for the United States of America. What is it? Pine tree? It is not. Douglas fir. Nope. It should be a Douglas fir. It should be. It should be. A, sequ um, like a sequoia? A redwood. One of those giant redwoods. That's a, these are all really good guesses. The only other thing that I feel like I can mention is it's not a maple, and I'm pretty sure they did that on purpose because, of course, we don't want to be to the no. an oak it is an oak it's a simple uh, old oak tree yep uh, this was uh, a vote hosted by the national arbor day foundation um oh my i mean how many people live in this country get over 300 million about 350 i think now that's right they got uh, 101 000 votes <laughs> it's just it's kind of paltry but uh yeah dogwood uh pine uh, made the top five 
Passage of the bill, uh, H.R. 1775, and the 108th Congress was led by Congressman Bob Goodlatte of Virginia, Senator Ben Nelson of Nebraska. It amended federal law to make the specific genus Quercus the national tree of the United States of America. Hmm. Yes. Do we have a national rock? I, I feel like we should. Yes, I mean, New do, we have a, oh. do we have a national insect? I, I yeah, feel like mosquito. we have that too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, so our funny. national bird should be a turkey instead of a bald eagle. eagle. That's true. That is true. I know Absolutely. that was Ben Franklin's suggestion. We should yep. listen to him. Professors, what country won the first ever World Cup 1930 in soccer? I can give you this much of a hint. The two finalists were both from South America. That narrows it down pretty quickly. Brazil. Uh, Brazil Argentina. or Argentina. Argentina was defeated, not by Brazil, in the final, 4-2, to two, in front of 93,000 people. Chile. Chile. Paraguay. Chicago? Ecuador. Let's go through all of them. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm afraid it was all the ones that you didn't mention. No, it was Uruguay. Uruguay defeated oh, Argentina. Uruguay, Paraguay's, you know. They're both Gways, you know. Yeah. All those Gways, yeah. Oh, my gosh. Professors, what Pulitzer Prize winning play later made into a movie was the inspiration for Thomas Hart Benton's sensuous 1948 painting, Poker Night? Interest. Hmm. Dogs playing poker. Oh, no, I'm kidding. You know, that's what it came to my mind. <laughs> Me too. Uh, for the record, yeah. Kimberly has at the bottom the painting obviously will never be confused with dogs playing poker. <laughs> that's what you think. <laughs> which, by the way, originated in 1894. Dogs playing poker. That's your trivia for today. But what Tennessee Williams um, uh, play became Thomas Hart Benton's sensuous 1948 painting Poker Night? Streetcar Named Desire? Streetcar Named Desire is a pretty oh. good guess, yeah. Because it was the year before. It was the year before. Glass Menagerie? No, it was the Streetcar Named Desire. Oh, oh, yep. okay. Oh, it was. Oh, 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 oh. I thought you said it was. Oh, I thought it was a good bad. guess. <laughs> yeah, no. Um, so for the record, Streetcar Named Desire, 1947. Um, the painting was 1948. Uh, the movie, uh, I believe we all know, Marlon Brando, Jessica Tandy, Kim Hunter, Carl Malden. That was 1951. So a quick turnaround with some. Uh, you left out the star. <gasps> Who's that? What? The streetcar? Um, yeah. Um, what's her name? Um, oh, she Elizabeth was. Elizabeth Taylor? No, she was in Gone with the Wind. Uh, Vivian, Jeff, uh, Lee. Oh, Vivian, Vivian Lee. Oh, Vivian Lee. Vivian Lee. <laughs> Professors, for what achievement was non-grid star George Toma inducted into the National Pro, Ho uh, Pro Football Hall of Fame in 2001? So did not play the game, but was inducted into the Football Hall of Fame in 2001. He invented the helmet, the face, uh, the kicking tee. I was no, thinking the helmet. That's good. That's good. Uh, pads. I don't know. Forward pass. Uh, no. Nope. Thing. Was it equipment related? It was not technically. Mm -hmm. He invented the yard marker. Yeah. Did he make uh, the field a hundred yards? Is that. I mean, you're getting very much closer. Um, George Toma had been the groundskeeper for every Super Bowl from 1967 to 2001. He also did groundskeeping for the 84 and 96 Olympics. And for much of his career, Tended the yard in Kansas City, Missouri, for of course the uh, great uh, Kansas City Royals, and was an inaugural inductee into Major League Baseball's Groundskeepers Hall of Fame in 2012. If you're good at what you do, hmm. hmm. Now, who who was it? Was it what's that? Heather? What's her name? In charge of Comerica Park. Oh yeah, Heather Heather Nabosny. Yeah, yeah sure. I wonder. Mm -hmm. I wonder if she's up for a yeah. Up for it. That's all. I, I remember she was getting some acclaim when you know America yeah. went up. So she was the first female heads ground head groundskeeper in Major League Baseball history at Comerica Park, and she's yep. still there. She's still yep. there. FYI, Toma officially retired in 1999, 2001, but continues to work as a consultant at age 93 for sports facilities all around the U.S. Boy, must be nice. Must be nice. Living his best life. That's cool. Who, yeah, it is. It's kind of cool to think. That yeah, he gets to cut grass and actually life. enjoy it. That's unlike right. Unlike the rest of us. 
<laughs> um, who was the only fictional character on the list Time Magazine's most 100 influential people of the 20th century as the millennium turned over? Pac-Man? It's not what it's character. Oh, Gordon Gecko? No, no. Homer Simpson. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm going no. for 98% credit there because it, it's Bart Simpson. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, you, you took it up the family tree. That's all. So. Yep, absolutely. Oh, my gosh. Don't have a cow over all this. But in 2000, Bart, along with the rest of the Simpsons, the Simpsons, not the voiceovers, um, were awarded a star on Hollywood's Walk of Fame. And of course, Nancy Cartwright, the voice of Bart for many decades, has earned a primetime Emmys and Annies uh, for her work on The Simpsons. Hmm. That's a background data there. We love it. Can't believe yeah. we just love it. How many hazard cards are there in a game of Millborn? Okay, there's flat tire, out of gas, uh, stop sign, flat tire, and collision. So was how many did I count? Four? <laughs> oh. Well, technically, they're saying that the answer is 18 because there are multiple copies oh. of each of those calamities. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever played uh, Millborn before. It's a popular worldwide road race card game invented in 1954. Um, there are five red stop, four speed limit, and three each of accident, flat speed tire, limit. and out of gas. Yes. Speed limit. Always forget that one. Yes. I'm telling you right now that um, my parents had a uh, version of the game, and they bought it in Canada. So the whole thing was in French, completely in yeah. French. Mm -hmm. And I just thought that it was colorful and cool. And I always wanted to play it. But since I could not read French, it was difficult. Very difficult. Matt, come on over. I got the bilingual edition. Mm -hmm. There you go. It looks like what we have here is something along the lines of 1960s. It became very, very popular in the United States. Kind of declined since then. But uh, yeah. In which U.S. city was the first hospital opened in 1752? Philadelphia. I think that's a pretty darn good guess because, of course, it was the streets of Philadelphia. Good old Ben Franklin and Thomas Bond opened the Pennsylvania Hospital, the very first hospital in the United States of America. Great guess, Jim. I mean, it was a good answer <laughs> i know you're not guessing i know you're not guessing uh speaking about the hospital's origins franklin was known to say i do not remember any of my political maneuvers the success of which gave me uh at the time more pleasure since 1997 pennsylvania hospital has been part of the upenn system and offers a full range of diagnostic and therapeutic medical services in addition to being the major teaching and clinical research for the university of pennsylvania still well, kidding there's a medical history museum there. That's right. That's right. Ah, there's that a, a mutter. Yeah, a chemical museum? history that, museum yeah, there that. too. When it comes to being a marsupial, what a great yes. question. <laughs> How does a kangaroo pouch differ from that of a wombat? The was it, I'm assuming the baby can feed with inside the kangaroo pouch. As far as I can tell from this explanation, that's true of both. Oh, okay. Um, tricky. tricky. Size? Stuff. Obviously size. Yeah, I think size uh, is definitely something, but that's not what it says here. There's something a little more, um, gosh, fundamental. Side entry, top entry, it comes with a zipper, what? <laughs> yeah, basically you covered all the bases. Butt. A kangaroo's pouch faces forward and opens oh. towards the head of the animal, the wombats is way lower and faces essentially down. So um, that is very, very interesting. Remember, kangaroos spend most of their time upright because gravity keeps the young in the pouch. For the wombat, which does a lot of burrowing, a backwards facing okay. pouch is gotcha. going to be okay. useful. Gotcha. Okay. So, We're glad to have you back. Wombats are looking at feet all the time. Yes, I think that they are. They are. Among other things. Ooh. My computer just like completely turned off. I mean, everything oh just gosh. went. Yeah. So uh -oh. uh, I came in here to plug my laptop. So the, it looks, I think the battery was just low. So I needed to sure. plug it into the actual. So anyway. Well, you look at good now. Yeah. We're Ho good. Hopefully I'm good now. We're so. good. We're good. Good. 
Uh, just a little side note, because that's what Kimberly's known for. There's only one marsupial native to North America. Do you know what it is? Opossum. Opossum, Opossum yes. Yeah. They're <laughs> ugly, mean yeah. little animals. But they eat, they eat pests. They, they eat, yeah, they eat all they the do. ticks. You know, I'm okay with the Oh, the ticks. I'm okay <laughs> with them. about the ticks. They are pretty funky looking. I'd much rather have them in, in my yard than the skunks at 3.30 in the morning. That's for dang sure. Whistle pig tops them all. True. Yeah, Whistle. Heather would <laughs> Heather would just cringe right about now. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Faye Dunaway co-starred with Steve McQueen in the Thomas Crown Affair movie that was made in 1968. She also had a role in the 1999 remake. What was it? She was his therapist. Yeah, that's what it says here. It's pretty interesting stuff. It's a oh great movie. Yeah. It's a great remake. I really liked it. Yeah, I mean, that it's was... not quite as good as the original, because if you don't have Steve McQueen, I mean, come on. But right. It was good. that was uh, Pierce Brosnan, right? And Rene Russo. Yep. Mm-hmm. Awesome. 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 Which planet weighs over twice as much as all the other planets known in our solar system combined? Jupiter. Ooh. Yeah, that's a pretty good guess. And it's absolutely correct. Fifth planet from the sun, largest in the solar system. It is a gas giant 2.5 times the mass of all the other planets in the solar system combined. It has a minimum 67 moons, including the four large moons called the Galilean moons, because they're big enough for Galileo to see in 1610. Ganymede, the largest, has a diameter greater than the planet Mercury. Jupiter's volume is, geez, 1,321 Earths, all put together. Whoa. Absolutely incredible. Yep. Wow. How high can Australia's flightless emu, the second largest bird alive today, jump? 30 feet. Seven feet. It says feet. seven feet right okay. off the ground. It says right. seven feet. I mean, that's that's pretty good. Uh, if you think about you it. ready for this? I'm just thinking fences. That's all. It's just thinking yep. fences. Oh, yeah. And it also can run um, at a top speed of what? 35 miles an hour? Miles an hour. You know, know, it says that that is its standard gait. So just to be clear, that's its regular walking speed. Mm -hmm. So it can hit 60 miles per hour. Holy crap. An emu? Yeah, that's what it says. Wow. Wow. Downhill (laughs) with a tailwind. Mm -hmm. Falling. (laughs) We all know that um, Eastern Michigan University really missed an opportunity when they got rid of their uh, indigenous uh, mascot and missed the chance to be the emus. Uh, Let's just be serious here, you know. (laughs) Come on. Come on. Oh, wow. I didn't even mean for it to go in that direction. And here's question 16. Which state was the first to hold an official Columbus Day observance? 1907. Um, Massachusetts. Yes. Yeah, I was. Yeah, Ohio seems to be the obvious one, but yeah, you know, it was way out west. Oh, Oregon. <laughs> Good guess, but uh, incorrect. <laughs> Wyoming. Uh, Idaho. Idaho. Washington. One of the four corners. Washington. Oh, oh, uh, no, Colorado. No, four corners. It was Colorado. Yeah, it says Colorado. Okay. Pretty interesting. They had started something. Uh, the Society of Saint Tammany also known as the Columbian Order, which commemorated the 300th anniversary of Columbus's landing, or rather decided to, (laughs) October 12, 1792 in New York City. Columbus Day was not made a federal holiday until 1971, despite there having been discussions about the same and lobbying by the aptly named Catholic organization, the Knights of Columbus, as early as 1892, when President Harrison issued a proclamation Um, that recommending to all the people observing in the localities the 400th anniversary of the discovery of America. False, 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 horrible, false. Happy Thanksgiving, Dave. Thank you. Okay, we have time for one more question. Just enough time for one more question. What did the pirate Blackbeard demand in exchange for hostages when his heavily armed fleet blockaded the harbor in Charleston, South Carolina, Mid May 1718. What did he? Hondike bar. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, 
bluebird matches his beard on fire. Yeah, there you go. Matches something <laughs> fundamental. It actually is. I mean, oh. by today's standards, we're talking 1718. By Fresh today's water. standards, this is fundamental. Uh, you're you're getting what, like, there, getting what, close. Like like a flush toilet or something like that. What? No, not a flush toilet, not water. Uh, rum? Booze? Getting closer. Not, not it wasn't women. food though. It wasn't oh. food though. He, Rob, ill. I don't know. <laughs> King you know what he on. wanted? He wanted a first aid kit. He wanted medicine oh, because his parents so. was so sick. Yes. That, okay, that almost sounds sad. noble. Yeah. Noble even. So, Blackbeard had captured nine sailing vessels. Oh, my Lord. One of which contained many prominent members of the Charlestown community demanding medicine from the colonial governor by threatening that the prisoners would be beheaded and the ships burned if the medicine was not supplied so oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Did, he, did he get it you know uh kimberly just gives us enough information oh. to be able to you know I mean, if get to if you've point. seen the series black sails mm -hmm. you get a really vivid depiction of what keel hauling uh -huh. looks like Ooh. yeah uh, and it's it's that's who they're doing it to it's it, true Mm -hmm. oh, all of those barnacles are awfully painful. Yeah. Oh. Oh. Ian, I've just Ouch. been watching a Taiko Atiti, uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. Meets Death, which I do not think is an accurate representation <laughs> of Blackbeard and his exploits, but it's really adorable. So, but stars Reese Davies, who is one yeah. of the funniest people ever to walk the earth. So, uh, yeah, my wife tried very, very hard to pull me in, but there's only 24 hours in the day and <laughs> only 30 minutes um, on every episode of Ask the Professor. Time has come for us to say goodbye, Beth. Bye. Jim. Goodbye. Aaron. Bye. And Dave. See ya. And now these words from University of Detroit Mercy. Ask the Professor is transcribed in, you know, all of our homes, but usually it's in the Briggs Building in the Department of Communication Studies in the College of Liberal Arts and Education at University of Detroit Mercy's McNichols campus. Ask the Professor is produced and technically directed by Michael Jason and Brian Masonville, and our executive producer is Professor Jason Roach. Until next week, I'm your host, Matt Mayo.